Hey, how's it going? Good, good. Um, so I'm s sitting upstairs on my roof. Can you, is that going to be a problem? <laughs> do you hear like the background? <laughs> do you hear the background noise, or is that okay? No, we're good. We're good. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm resident of Collwood, Jewel Saints, and joining me tonight is blog writer John Philip Bentoncourt. For those who don't know, he has been writing for the past four years a Dark Shadows blog entitled The Return of Dark Shadows. I and many, many others have been following along. Um, so what got you into Dark Shadows, man? Uh, it's a lot like your story. I remember reading about and hearing about, you did a video a while back about how you got into it. It's almost really, really similar, which is kind of cool. Um, I was homesick as well. I was in junior high. And um, uh, sci-fi, sci-fi was playing reruns of it over and over again that morning that I was home. And I had no idea what I was watching. It was the strangest thing. And I was just hooked. It was just interesting and kind of, I don't know, it's just something about the whole family was uh, really, really cool. So, yeah, I got hooked on in junior high. That's really cool. What, what possessed you to write a blog to, to even begin writing? I've been writing stuff for years, and uh, it was Halloween about, I would say, four years ago Yeah, when I started. And Decades was repeating um, uh, Dark Shadows episodes. And I thought about it, and I was like, what would happen if somebody were to write or create it? It was mainly an idea of why, would they, why haven't they done a, a reboot of it? And the idea of my reboot would be what I've been writing. And I thought, well, no one's really done it before. Let me just write a few chapters. Let me just write something fun. Let me just do this for fun for a little bit. And it really kind of exploded into something what you see now. It's just huge, in my eyes, huge. Because, I mean, 150 chapters is a lot of content that I've created based around this tiny little idea of what would happen if. So it started from there, just seeing that decades of doing something, was rerunning something over and over again that I thought could, in a way... Uh, be explored differently if somebody were to create a new version of it but not repeat what's been done sort of continue the story as of now what would happen in 20 at the time it was 2015 so what would happen in 2015 with the collins family that's interesting you said that because that sort of leads me right into my next question for you when did you realize this was going to be a continuation from the beginning oh. i didn't want to write something sort of like repeating like what I think you and I have had this conversation before where right. repeating the same stuff that's happened is sort of redundant why would we want to see how Barnabas gets released from his his crypt or his uh, coffin we know that already we know how it's done why right. would we want to know how Paul Stardard wasn't really murdered and how you know McGuire was tricking Elizabeth we know that already why would we want to repeat that that's been done pretty much twice already um, and I just thought you know Carolyn never got to grow up, and David Shirley never got to grow up, and their lives were never really explored to the point of had they been married and if they had children and what their what the part of the curse would affect them as adults and their kids. And uh, you and I, since you know you do your own uh, story, you've done the same thing, and I think it's amazing, and it's sort of something that I think should have been done years ago, but never really. Um, never really got to that nobody ever was able to do that and i think the show might have been able to do that had they expanded those characters to a larger degree other than going in circles with time when you started this you started this with jack thorne who's a brand new character and is married to carolyn stoddard for some 35 years mm -hmm. was was carolyn always going to be the initial one you started with Yes, because I, I really like Carolyn as a character in general from the show. I think she's, first of all, I think she's hilarious. I think she's such a brat and so spoiled. In the beginning, way in the beginning before Barnabas, she was just someone almost insufferable. I mean, you kind of want to slap her around sometimes, not literally, but <laughs> she's she's she, she's mean. She's kind of spoiled and her mom. And she, in a way, has a right to be because she is always complaining about how she never gets to leave Colin, Collinwood and she's sort of trapped in a way just like her mom is because she feels like she can't leave her mom um, but I liked that aspect of her that she was really a spitfire and she sort of reminds me of Marilyn from the Munsters because she's sort of like the quote unquote normal one of the family but she's really not she's even she's just as messed up as the rest of them so my idea was that what would happen if Carolyn who was had such a had such a um, what's the word I'm looking for 
where she had such a, 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 a hate, love-hate relationship with her, her family. She loved them because they were her family, but she hated them because there was so much going on around them that she couldn't really figure out. And I thought about, you know, her life. I really just centered it around her, basically selfishly, because I liked her. There was no other reason. I like that. I, I think that was very smart, the way you did that. Like, first you introduce Jack, who, again, is this brand-new character. We don't know about him. But we now you're telling us he's been married. Was there ever? And again, you didn't just go back and use a character they had already used. You didn't use Adam or even um, you know, Don, the character Don Briscoe played. You created a whole new character. So was there ever? Right, right. Was there ever a thought of using an older character, or no? Was it always going to be a new character? I wanted to start with a clean slate because if okay. she had married somebody that had already been on the show. Um, that, that would have come with a lot of baggage. There would have been a lot more into that. I would have to explore. It would have been harder to write for me, basically, because there was already so much written with that character. So let's say she did get married to, say, um, let's say Jeb Hawks. I mean, let's say I retconned and said that Jeb right. Hawks never died. Maybe she, maybe she stayed with Jeb. There's a lot of baggage with that. And so giving her somebody brand new was easy because then we could explore something different. Now we have her whole life in London between the time she married Jack, how did she marry Jack? How did they get to London? How did she meet Jack? So there's also that big portion that I've never written. I don't even know. I haven't even discovered it myself. So there's that easy aspect of another story to maybe in the future, or there's all that, you know, that's all a gray area. We don't know anything about between the time Carolyn disappeared from Collinsport to when she returned with her husband and when Alex was little, her daughter. So there's, there's also, that's a whole new avenue that we can explore later on. So I, I'd like to bring you someone brand new so that we could have something fresh and, and new to, to explore later on. That brings me to another to my next question. Alexander Thorne, who is Carolyn's daughter, and I found it real interesting that you had the daughter of Angelique be your first real villain. Was was she always going to be your first villain? Was Yes, she was. Oh. She was gonna be the first villain. I, I really intended her to be if you if you look at the first characters you kind of see and I did this purposely you see sort of a parallel to the old show there Carolyn is Elizabeth right. um, Caleb is um, in a way Roger David sort of a mixture of both because David wasn't in the, wasn't around in the first part so he's a mixture of Roger and David um, Alex is Carolyn when she's younger uh, Jack slash Leopold is sort of the Barnabas and then Cla uh, Claudia is Angelique so I have these kind of like mirror images of the first show and I built around that so I really wanted Claudia to stay throughout the whole thing of course I didn't really know how long I'd be doing it but I really wanted her to be around for a really really long time but as things go things progress and different stuff pops in my brain and and we start creating different uh, different storylines and she she didn't last that long but yeah she, she was definitely intended to be there for the, for the long haul Right, because Jack gets turned into Leopold, a vampire, is that was just so interesting how you did that. And so I gotta ask, was it out of all the older characters, who was like the hardest to keep away the longest in a sense, like someone you didn't want to reveal right away? So as as the uh, story progresses, um, I didn't really know how I was gonna bring David back. I really wanted David back because I thought having Caleb and um, Kimberly, if you remember, Kimberly is David's right. wife. Yep. Um, having them be in town and not David was sort of weird, and I did have this mystery planned of like the whole um, organization of the True Hearted. They're sort of behind a lot of the bad stuff that's happening, and I knew David was involved in that somehow. I just didn't really realize how much or how little or um, where he was for, for a while. I couldn't really put it in my brain at that point. I knew something was going to – I knew I had to bring him back because I really wanted him. So he was really hard to bring back. Uh, Julia was really hard. I, Julia is another character that I love. And she wasn't at all in it forever. Right. And I didn't think I could bring her back because unlike Barnabas or, or Angelique or any of the other characters um, that I brought back from the other shows, I brought them back supernaturally in a way, um, with the exception of, uh, 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 gosh, I'm losing your name, uh, <laughs> well, now I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, with the exception of um, Carolyn, sorry. 
with the exception of Carolyn and a few others, um, you know, I brought back Elizabeth in a dream right. sequence. Right. I brought back um, uh, Abigail and Josette differently, but, but all supernatural ways. So Julia, I was I couldn't, I couldn't bring her back in a supernatural way that made sense to me. So I just kept putting her off and putting her off. And she showed up in series, I think, seven in a flashback. Um, but then I came up with this idea and series eight or nine, no, yeah, series nine was all about how Barnabas was going to get his wife back and he's going to bring her back somehow. And then there she is, shows up in an, as a dead body in his coffin. I, I found that so interesting because it, even though you don't, like, like you said, you didn't, you did mention her. You always seem to mention the characters, even though you don't show them necessarily, like Elizabeth. Then Elizabeth is, like you said, shown in a dream sequence. I always found that curious. And it was so. You kept tying this back to the original series. Was that always your intent? Always, because I know how, um, you know, for me, Dark Shadows is something that I sort of found by accident and sort of enjoyed for a while. But there are a lot of people who read my version, not my version of it, but my universe, who are super fans of it and really want to read it and really want to hear from the old people, the old characters that they love. And I thought, well, to be fair to myself, somebody who's creating something and to be fair to people who really enjoy this type of work i thought i have to mention them i have to bring some of them some of them back here and there to get them to, to get to the to get readers to enjoy it you know sort of feel the old show in my version of it and um so i had to drop them here and there and put a little little salt and pepper of elizabeth here and a little bit of salt and pepper of you know whoever um just to kind of keep it interesting but the reason why I mention – sometimes I'll mention a character through another character, like in passing somebody will say, well, so-and-so said this about whatever, right. uh, or so-and-so's at work right now, whatever, you know, in, in, in dialogue. I thought it was I, – I needed to do that because a lot of times if you watch the old show, you'll, you'll see the storylines go on and you never hear from other characters. You don't know where Elizabeth is. She's never around. Right. And then she shows up and you're just kind of like, oh, she's been there the whole time, but she doesn't really know what's going on. So I wanted to make sure everybody – was either accounted for or, or was there even though they weren't there you know what i mean i didn't want it to be sort of like i just didn't want it to be awkward where david david's storyline isn't in front and center but you don't hear from him i wanted to, the readers to still know those characters were still in town in a way so yeah i did drop hints of everybody else speaking as a reader someone who has read your blog i could tell that you went to great pains to make sure every character had an involvement one way or the other like you said either in mention of you know in a conversation where they mentioned somebody of maybe where they were or they didn't know where they were at the time and then you told us where they were sort of as the narrator as a storyteller and i always found that so interesting and fascinating it did that always come natural to you to be able to do that it comes from um when i was kind of in school, when I would write for, uh, we would have sort of um, uh, these times where our teacher would say, you know, we have, uh, they would give us sort of a, a homework to write a, a creative story or something, creative writing assignment, this type of thing. And my, my critiques were always that I wasn't descriptive enough, that everything that I w had written hadn't been described either correctly or enough or sufficiently for the reader to know what was really happening or to, to see it in their brain. So for me, it's sort of like a, an obsession to make sure that whatever is in my brain, whatever I'm seeing in my storyline, I'm writing down the best way possible so that you or whoever is reading it can either see it almost identical to what I've described it or some version of it so that we're all on the same page so that every no everyone knows exactly what is going on almost to the T. And sometimes it's a little overboard. Sometimes I describe way too many waves. Sometimes I describe way too many uh, gusts of wind that blow through somebody's hair. But to have a, a, a product or, a, or something that I've done like this, like this fan fiction, to have it have the same feel as a, as a television show is super important to describe those things. So you can watch a TV show like Dark Shadows and mm -hmm. see that uh, Victoria will wrap herself with a jacket or, or a coat and tie it. And that's something very subtle. But when I want to get a reader to feel that same feeling, I kind of have to describe it in a way that's, you know, useful to the story. So, yeah, I'm a little over descriptive, but it, all that comes from um, 
being in school and being told that I wasn't descriptive enough. That sort of answers my question that I wanted to ask you because I, I've always thought, man, you describe the scene so well. So that criticism sort of paid off because you've always described the setting of the town of Collinsport and the people in it and what they're doing so very well. So what is Collinsport to you, the writer, in a sense? Um, that's a really interesting question. What is Collinsport to me? Um, well, it's a town like every, any other any other town, but it's something like there's something very – there's a magical aspect of New England to me. I've never really been to New, New England very much, especially towns like – Collinsport or, you know, anywhere that's, you know, old fashioned that way. I've been to the bigger cities, but, um, I've never been to somewhere that remote, that kind of, uh, oldy, old towny kind of thing. And so there's a romantic aspect of it. There's a little village with, you know, a sea, it's a sea fishing village. It's, it's quaint, it's cute, but there's something really crazy going on. And that is something super interesting to me. Like if you think about all of the, these TV shows like, um, Twin Peaks and, and uh, uh, Colin, I mean, uh, Dark Shadows, of course, and and even uh, movies like It, like Dairy Maine. Right. All of those towns are super cute and beautiful and, and and quintessential and all that kind of stuff. But there's something really dark going on in all of those towns, and that is something really interesting to me. The light with the dark, the beauty with the ugly. That's those two contrasts really really interest me. Who to you was out of all your characters like? new and old who was your favorite to do, to write for um barnabas is really fun because he is he's so much i mean there's so much about him that is so interesting he is like i said i like contrast in things i like dark and light uh you know black and white evil and he is that he is the good he is the evil he is a hero he is a villain he is someone he is real he is not real he's dead he's alive he's everything He's all that in one person, and he's really interesting to write for because you can write him in any way you want. He's a blank ca canvas, even if you – some people think, oh, he's a vampire. That's really all he is, but he's really not a vampire. Uh, that's really not all he is. There's so much more about him. He's somebody who's – you know, who hates who he is but loves who he is in a way. Mm -hmm. He is very passionate, but he's not passionate because, you know, in my stories, there are times where he's – super into what he's doing and trying to get to where he's going but a lot of times he falls back and just you know doesn't want to deal with anything because you know he's been doing it for how many years you know two three centuries he's he's tired he's a tired vampire so there's a lot of times where he does fall back and kind of just lets things go crazy around him but then of course you know he he got to get back into it so there's those aspects about it he's a ping pong ball he's back and forth and that's really interesting to me where he can be alive and dead at the same time and people are constantly in this love-hate relationship with him, whether you're a reader or someone in the story. Carolyn, for example, she has, throughout my story, they've had, Carolyn and Barnabas have had their little talks together. There are times where they sit in her bedroom and he appears to her and they have discussions and sometimes they're great and sometimes they're very volatile. One of them, they fought and she threw a book at his head. So there are, there are times where he's a huge part of, part of the problem and other times he comes to her and they kind of talk about what's going on and he gives her some advice. So he's he's basically everything. He's everything the story is about. So he's one of my favorites. Carolyn, again, is one of my favorites to write about. She's, um, she's the matriarch. She keeps everyone in line as much as she can. Mm -hmm. uh, she's the heroine in a way. She's gone through so much in my story. I've shot her. She went into a, she's gone through a mirror to a different time warp. She's been uh, in a plane crash. She's been uh, kidnapped and by a zombie she's been through everything so they're fun to write for you introduced christopher reed who was a werewolf in your very first chapter and i really loved that was was there a a preference for either vampire or werewolf that is hard um no i don't think there was a preference i think i wanted uh, I want so Leopold was the vampire throughout those three, uh, th those three big beginning series, and right. like you said, Chris was the, the werewolf. So obviously they they're always set up against each other, a werewolf versus a vampire. And I didn't know which one I wanted to be the sympathetic one. So um, 
usually with a sympathetic character, people root for that person or that, that character. So I didn't know which one people would root for. Even though Leopold was a clear villain, sometimes people will root for the villain. But I wasn't sure. So um, I think if I look back, I think Christopher was really the one I, I was more sympathetic towards that I really liked the most in a way because he was young and he uh, kind of didn't know why he was a vampire. I'm sorry, why he was a werewolf. You know, he was used by his parents. He was kind of uh, created that way um, for as to be used as a weapon. So he was kind of, you know, put in this position by his family to be some kind of, to be weaponized against the Collins family. So I kind of liked Christopher for that. He was, I, I really, I was in his corner for the most part. I, I will admit, as a reader, it was easier to get into Christopher's corner because as soon as I read that, I was like, man, that poor son of a bitch. I mean, <laughs> like, uh, you know what I mean? It just, it was easy to sort of like, look, like, man, that guy, wow. I feel sorry for you, buddy. Um, yeah, and he, and he just never got to, li- I think maybe also, I didn't really, he didn't really get to live out his life fully. You know, right. he's, super, he's super young. He's supposed to be in his 20s and he you know, finds out he's a werewolf towards the end of his life, really. He, he doesn't really get much to do towards the end of it. Right. It, talk to me about transferring, you know, the decision to sort of kill him off. Was he, like, the hardest? Who was the hardest, I guess I want to ask, to kill off for you? Definitely. Christopher was pretty hard. I mean, he, for the most part, the reason why he was so hard was not because I liked him so much, but because... I felt bad for Alexandra. Isn't that strange? Like, I felt no. actually bad for a character that's fake. I felt bad for them because they had gone to London um, for a couple of a couple of series in between, I think, in between five and eight or something. Uh, they'd gone to London, and they were supposed to be kind of living a happy life in London. And then I decided to bring them back. And, of course, when someone comes back to Collinsport, nothing good ever happens. And they're, you know, a young, loving couple, and he basically gets taken from her. So... Um, and then, of course, he really doesn't die in a way. I mean, he does, but he doesn't. You know, he comes back in an right. interesting, interesting format so that he's gone, but he's not gone. And obviously, you can see I didn't really want him to go 100%. <laughs> right. Him around some sort of way. I, I really, for those who don't know, Christopher's D- werewolf DNA was transferred into Andrew Shaw. And I, his dad, who I, in my reviews I called, you know, asshole. But... <laughs> Um, it, and he was a very interesting heel. His father was, was he difficult to sort of kill off because he no, was such a, I despised a... him. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I actually did not like, I did not like Jeffrey Shaw. I mean, that's pretty, he was jerk. He was, right. he was really mean to Quinn. He was horrible to women. If you look at the way I wrote him, I don't even know why I did it, but he was pretty rude to most of the women. Serena, he was horrible to Serena. He was horrible to Quinn. And, um, uh, he was pretty gross to his own son. Right. We, and, I mean, you know, he was just a, just a jerk. Like you said, he was horrible. So, <laughs> no, when he died, I was very ready for him to die. It, Quinn, I, it, if I had to, again, Victoria is one of my favorite characters because you turned her heel, and I want to talk about that here with Ooh, you. Yes, I, let me go back to one of your other questions. She's actually very fun to write about, write for as well, but go on. Um, but we'll go back to Victoria, but Quinn is really a great character i really love her mannerisms and it people might say how do you get mannerisms in a story again you take us there and i just pitch when she ripped up that contract in front of jeffrey i just like i clapped i said you tell that <laughs> motherfucker but uh, tell, just ex- again a great character so explain that to me like how did you go about just creating her well i kind of studied studied I watched a lot of uh, uh, Grayson Hall episodes of Dark Shadows. I mean, she's her granddaughter. So I wanted to kind of create right. this um, younger version of what Julia might have been like when she was younger. And um, uh, Julia was spunky. She had some spark in her. She was tough. I mean, to think about it, Julia Hoffman was a doctor in her own right, mm-hmm. probably from the 1950s through, you know, however long she lived. That's pretty remarkable for a woman in those days. And she must have had some strength and had to stand up and do what she had to do to get where she wanted. And so I thought about Quinn and how Quinn got where she got, especially with her history. Her father was, uh, you know, 
and Julia's uh, uh, son that she abandoned, but right. uh, he was he had his own trauma, and so Quinn must have somehow absorbed some of his trauma, her own father's trauma, so it made her stronger. So she's a strong woman, and she's determined, and she's going to do what she has to do to make sure that, one, she's not hurt in the process of whatever's happening, and she's not going to let someone run, a, run her over. And Jeffrey definitely wanted to run her over, and a lot of times she, she stood her ground and stood up to him as much as she could. I really love her attitude, just her pure... She's got so much, you said spunk, I'll, I'll use another word, fire. And <laughs> you really, when you read it, you really read her intensity. And she has no problem letting it loose, and I love that. Um, it, when you brought Julia back, were, did you know right away you were going to go into her past? Uh, yeah, so definitely, for sure I did. Because Julia is probably one of the three or four maybe less than that, characters from the original show that we know zero about. And I thought that was super interesting that nobody ever thought about, you know, a way to expand a character on a soap opera is to give them a family, right. to give them a, some sort of background and just give them some sort of um, past to then explore and then you can expand the show even further with those characters. And then that's just how shows like serialized dramas work, right? So I thought about, oh my gosh, you know, Julia never had a past. They never... Not that I can recall it. Maybe they did and I didn't know this, but from what I remember, I don't remember hearing about where she came from, who right. she, you know, uh, we, if she had children, if she was married before. And Grayson Hall was probably in her mid-40s or early 40s when she started on the show. So that means Julia was around that age. To think that Grayson, or to think that Julia never had anything going on in the past when she was younger is ridiculous. So, of course, I was like, this is perfect. Like, she can come back and somehow, some way, I have to link her past to her so that we can find out where Julia was, who Julia was, what, what happened to her before she arrived in Collinsport. I think it was an amazing adventure you took us on in the, her past. And it really sort of relates to her future and her relationship, why she is the way she is with men, including Barnabas. Right, right. And you'll, you'll see that now in Series 11. She, um, you know, she's definitely... Right. We're going to explore that a little bit further with Quinn because right now, Quinn doesn't know. Quinn knows who she, who she is, and they're going to kind of uh, meld together a little more. They're going to get to know each other a little better. But uh, the secret of Julia's past hasn't really reached Quinn yet. Wow. And she kind of... Uh, she punches into Julia about it because she wants to know why Julia left her father. Why, why did Julia abandon him so much and why did why, why didn't she just come back so that's going to be a tough one for julia because she has to figure out a way to not only stick together with her granddaughter that she just found out i mean this is her blood right. so much of her life has been involved with somebody else's blood i mean in the collins family and now she has her own biological blood in her life and she is dead set on making sure that quinn never knows the truth and as we know quinn is dead set on getting what she wants yeah, I really, that is, I can't wait to read that. I'm so excited, because I read, I read, even though you, I read it early when you sent it to me, I read it twice today, your new uh, Whispers, and again, amazing, amazing job. Um, Thank you. I, I can't speak highly enough about this series, and it leads me straight to Victoria, too, making her a heel, making her a villain. Was that always an intent for you? Uh, yeah, uh, we talked about this right. before too privately. But uh, uh, I, before starting the whole thing, I definitely looked up a lot of interviews and a lot of different old episodes just to be sure. Because you know, I haven't seen the whole of Dark Shadows. I've seen a lot of it, but not all, but all of it. So there are little pieces of, of the puzzle that I needed to fill in for myself to kind of remember and know. And um, I found a lot of. Uh, Victoria Isles uh, videos and interviews and she, as we spoke about she said that had she ever returned to Dark Shadows, she would have wanted Victoria to be a bit of a villain. And I thought that is perfect. She's missing, in my series she's missing, people don't really know where she's at she isn't really talked about in the beginning um, when she does come back um, she does, she's a villain and she does some pretty horrible things and um, uh, I think for a good full series she's the villain throughout the whole thing I mean, I right. think I think Victoria Isles would have loved it. I hope. 
I I think it was very fascinating because not only did you bring her back as a villain, you gave her the ability to control time travel, sort of at will. Very a very sort of comic book like way. <clears throat> what what went into that to give her the that ability? I didn't want her to come back as uh, a villain with no uh, with no weaponry, with right. no weapons. Like I didn't want her to just come back and start messing with people uh, uh, at random. You know, she needed something at her. She needed an arsenal. She needed something that she she could have. Because you know, Barnabas is immortal in a way. Angelique is a witch. Um, uh, uh, Alexandra is possessed early on by Claudia, so she also contains a little bit of magic mm-hmm. in her. So everybody involved sort of has a little bit of supernatural ability. And Victoria, to have to be a villain, I couldn't just have her be. Well, I guess I could have, but I couldn't just have her be a regular human and not have some kind of power. So I thought, well, what if she was able to time travel and that ability just never left her? Maybe it became part of her. Maybe it became a way that she could come and go as she wanted because you know she'd been doing it for so many years maybe Mm -hmm. it's now part of her whole body maybe that's just who she is it's something would you say it's something she just learned to control eventually yeah i think it's definitely something she's learned to control i think it's something that maybe she always had and we just never knew i could definitely see that that's like i said it's so it was just something straight out of a comic book which i i know you're a fan of and i appreciate so much to read that and go, oh my god, that's that's amazing. And I love that. Even though she started off as a heel in your story. Which sort of leads me to my next question. Because who, which writers have inspired you? Oh gosh. Um, so when I was younger, um, uh, we didn't have cable right away. So we had only five TV channels. So in the summertime, when I would be home from school, all we had was daytime soap operas. So obviously, as you can, from my writing, you can see, uh, I definitely like a good soap. So Dave, or, uh, uh, gosh, Jane Z. Riley, who wrote for Days of Our Lives and Passions, he did a lot of that supernatural stuff from those shows. Well, all of Passions, but a lot of the 90s stuff from Days of Our Lives was was him all the creepy like devil worship not devil worship but devil possession and burying alive and all of those weird stuff that popped up really really fascinated me so he's one of them i really like um edgar Allan poe's writing i guess mm-hmm. that's kind of a strange segue but i like his stuff um i like um wow that's a hard one uh, emily bronte's pretty cool i I really just that is that's amazing and between because I know you're a comic book guy I got I gotta ask this because I've asked this of everybody I know Marvel or DC Marvel <laughs> okay I was obsessed with the X Men I think we all were like did you <laughs> did you watch the '90s anime series Oh my God yes I know okay. the theme song still <laughs> I actually had the theme song on my old computer and i don't (laughs) have the computer anymore but yeah yeah but um to sort of get back on track because i don't want to get off track but when did you did you know you were going to introduce maggie evans into this oh gosh we haven't talked about maggie have we no so maggie i don't even know how i thought about her oh yes i do okay so when I brought David back, um, I wanted him to have a way to escape. Well, let's, he was trapped in Wincliffe. So right. David's been trapped at Wincliffe for 20-some years um, between the 90s and uh, when he came back, which I think was 2016 or 17. And so somebody at Wincliffe had to uh, get him out. He didn't really know how. He was really kept in solitary by, the, by Joanna Grayson, who was the, part of the whole organization keeping him there. And somebody needed to free him. So I thought, well, who haven't I met? And I definitely knew it had to be somebody from the original show. Because at this point, I had enough new characters that I wanted to bring someone else back from, from the original. And I kept thinking, who, who haven't I done? Who haven't I done? And I didn't want to use Vicky yet. And I thought, oh, God, I haven't even touched on Maggie. So but not even in, a, not even in like a uh, passing or in sort of a flashback, I'd never touched on Maggie. And she's another one that we kind of 
she just disappears through after the show. We don't know really what happens to her. So I thought, there we go, Maggie. Maggie's perfect. The original show ended with, I think, parallel time. So we don't know what happened to Maggie. So there, I chose Maggie. I find she was the one that was going to get David out. Yeah, I when I read the Wincliffe and she got him out, I was like, wow, he's really. You made her feel so important, and you made her a mother in this as well. And what they did with her later on in the, not the early 60s series, obviously, but later on when Vic, they, Victoria Winters went away when Alexander Isles left, and they just made Maggie the governor. So I'm like, really? That That's what you're going to do? You know, yeah, I wasn't yeah. I wasn't happy with that, but you, you made her character mean so much more. And when I read that, I'm like, Oh man, that's so cool. Was it always was she always going to be a mother in your story? Yes, and so if you remember, I kind of this is a storyline that I dropped because I thought, oh, this just doesn't work. Like, there's a storyline where so she's basically the mother of three. She's the mother of Sebastian and Cat. Right. And if you remember, I wrote that she's the mother of Nicholas Blair Jr. There's a, yeah. there's a part where Nicholas Blair had it just it was a bad storyline. I'll admit. It's one where Nicholas Blair sort of steals her embryo in some sort of in the Black Wedding. Do you remember the Black Wedding in the original show? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I retcon that where he takes her embryo and impregnates it and blah, 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 and then creates this devil child named Nicholas Blair Jr. And he comes back. I think this is series five or six in my stuff. And he's sort of horrible and he does terrible things. But I just really did not like that storyline. I don't know why I did it. So there's... Um, so he's basically written, I think, I think I kill him later on. I think of, uh, Sebastian kills him. Or is it Chris? One of the werewolves kill him later on. But I just thought this is not a really good storyline. But I definitely wanted her to have children, have a husband or two somewhere. And she had to have a history as well. I mean, we have 40-some years after the show went off the air to, do, to kind of uh, explore what happened to Maggie. And, of course, she gets into a really bad relationship with somebody and, and eventually gets uh, taken to Wincliffe. So I, that that was really important. She did have to have a family of her own. Uh, Nicholas should have probably never been written, but oh well, it is what it is. I think we all write characters, like every writer writes a character, like, eh, we'll just put him in there and it'll be okay. <laughs> but <laughs> my, I think my idea was Rosemary's Baby sort of thing. Gotcha, um, gotcha. And Rose, and Rose, yeah, Rosemary's Baby kind of, you know, he's the devil's baby. But we don't see what happens when he grows up. And I thought, well, what if Rosemary's baby grew up? Maggie. Maggie can have Rosemary's baby. But then I just thought, oh, God, this is really not working. And I don't even like his name, Nichols Blair Jr. Like, it's just such a cheesy name. That was that was bad on my part. Did you ever think about, and I know this is a way late suggestion, <laughs> but I just thought of it. So what about um, Morningstar Evans? Because... We always heard that the devil was Michael Morningstar was a name, a nickname for the devil. Oh, I did not think of that, and that's a really cool name, actually. That's very, uh, that's very seventies, very hippie <laughs> Morningstar. Right, right. <laughs> but um, no, I think that it was again, it, it, the werewolves too, as well. You had multiple, like Christopher, like you said, Christopher and Sebastian, but in I like what you did with Angelique as well, having her fight Chris, uh, Andrew, Sebastian, and Maggie becoming a werewolf. Is briefly, yeah, yeah, right, briefly, and again, that was such an, an epic battle. And I know people are gonna say I'm being silly, and I, I get why. But I saw Avengers Endgame, and read your story, and I dare say that was as good as that fight sequence wow. in that movie. last chapters of each series i think i hope i'm not being lying here but i think a lot of the last chapters have sort of this big fight scene or some kind of big thing that happens to kind of tie it all up and i i was like what happened each one gets bigger and bigger so each fight scene each battle gets bigger and i think this one was the biggest i mean it was two witches and three three werewolves so it was huge right was there always going to be an attempt uh intend to have multiple werewolves in your story uh not at the same time <laughs> not at the same time <laughs> okay um let me see here so 
it's just, it's just one of those things that happens. You know, you're writing. Right. I mean, you know, this year you write all the time, and I've seen I've read your stuff too. I mean, do you, do you write from from your idea to the end point? Does it always match up? Like for me, it doesn't. I write an idea, I write a, a, an outline of a story, and they almost never match up by the end of the actual finished product because my brain keeps working, keeps changing. And I keep thinking, oh, this would be better. Oh, this would be better. So okay. the storylines for me are kind of fluid. They they never really match up to the outline that I set up for myself at the beginning of the whole process. Right. So I, ne- I had no intent of having three werewolves battle two witches. If, if my stuff matches up, honestly, God be with me, because it's like, it's, it's like, it would be like incomplete tic-tac-toe, XX nothing, it really would, that would be sometimes, my but, shit. Sometimes that's, but what an adventure that is, you know, for yourself as a writer, that's an adventure to kind of like create stories in your head, and then as you're going, it, it changes as it goes, that's even funner, to be a writer and not have yourself blocked in by any sort of, any sort of outline, even though, for me, I do an outline just so I can have an idea, but as you're writing and it changes, that's even fun because you you don't even know where you're going. You have no idea where your own story is going. That's the best part of being a writer. I think the most consistent I've been with with story was Halloween nine and ten, and that was years ago. And it, and ever since then, like everything, like I said, it's been incomplete tic tac toe. But um, <laughs> just <laughs> I again, we're not trying to stray. I swear, but um. <laughs> Okay, hold on a second. I gotta look at my sheet of paper. What I got right there. Um, so all these characters you created. Let's see: uh, Joseph uh, Helsing, Jack Thorne, Kimberly Grayson Collins, uh, Victor Reed, Christopher Reed, Alexander Thorne, Jonathan Silva. I mean, um, Thatcher uh, Banning, Sebastian Banning, Kate Banning Collins, Caleb Collins, Curtis Winters, Jacqueline uh, Walsh Collins. And Evangeline, uh, Angeline Collins, which is Claudia, Sobahan, who I've mispronounced so much and I apologize for. John. Siobhan, Siobhan. Okay, Siobhan, I'm so sorry. There you go. That's oh, right. look, I got it right. <laughs> <laughs> John Collins. Just how did you come up with all these characters? I have, well, I have no idea. Do you mean the names or just the, the people? Just in, I guess in general. Uh, you know, it's all about, I mean, again, as you would know, as a writer, it's all about piecing together a puzzle and making sure that one family, because they're really mostly all family members, one family member connects to the family in a correct way, meaning that it makes sense to have that person. So if, if for example, Maggie, if Maggie had two children, she obviously had a husband. So, okay, there's the husband. So I got now a complete family. And I always wanted Maggie to connect to the Collins family somehow, other than being just a friend of the family, other than being, you know, Michael uh, David's former governess. She had to be connected to them more than that. And so that's where Kat marries Caleb. So everybody's pieced together to make this whole kind of collage of people. And, you know, it's a whole, it's really just about a, a family, a mother, father, kids, uh, ex-wives. Paul Barnabas has, has a lot of ex-wives. So everybody is connected through being a family. I, I asked you this on Messenger, so I apologize for repeating the question. Is there a character from the series you wanted to bring back and just didn't? Uh, from the original series? Right. Um, oh, gosh. Um, um, I don't know. Uh I love that I never wrote about um, maybe 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 you know I uh, the other day I was watching uh, I think it's the 1840 storyline Samantha Drew is okay. that right I believe so I yeah. like her she's, she's 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 crazy I really like her so maybe I'll say Samantha Drew maybe yeah Adam Adam's pretty that's a great character Adam's a great character the idea of him is pretty cool I, I never had a Frankenstein character so Adam maybe Samantha Drew yeah when you did Dr. Shaw, when you introduced him and you did sort of his laboratory, it was, it didn't even like feel like Adam at all, the way you did that. Was that always important to be different from what sort of what the original had done? You didn't want to like monkey see, monkey do? 
Yeah, totally. Not just with Dr. Shaw and the whole uh, DNA sequence thing. Um, with a lot of the storylines, I really, really, really tried to make sure that nothing was the same. I, as much as possible that you can do with a show, I mean, with a with 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 stuff like this, with supernatural and stuff. I mean, really, there's not a whole lot you can expand on. A witch is a witch is a witch, you know. But I wanted to make sure that I didn't repeat ways that, uh, for example, Barnabas came back. I did not want to repeat, and he came back a lot. My stuff. I didn't want to repeat the same way he came back. I didn't want it to be uh, almost identical to uh, the show at all because then that would be negating exactly the point of of the, the, the work, right? I wanted to create something that was an extension of the show and not have it be repetitive because that's what we've seen before. We've seen the show be repetitive in you know, 1991, 2006 or whatever. So I, that was really something I worked really hard to not do. And I think sometimes I actually repeated myself a few times. There are there are a couple things that I, I did a few times that I think maybe I should have figured out a different way. But in hindsight, I mean, there's not there's not a lot you can do at, at certain points. You had you have grown such a huge following on your Facebook page, and many people just love this. When did you realize you really caught fire with this? Um. Uh, I don't know. I mean, there's still, I still don't think I've caught fire. <laughs> Sometimes I think, wow, it's really great. And other times I think, oh, what am I doing this for? You know, but probably about two years ago, two years ago in December, I remember I was on, I was visiting my family um, around Christmas time and uh, I used Blogger, the website, and I was looking at Blogger to see what was going on and had anybody had seen the newest chapter. And I reached like 5,000 views on one single chapter. And it was crazy, and I had no idea why. I think somewhere, somehow, that link to that chapter was shared somewhere, and it was clicked on by a lot of people. So, but that's the highest I've ever gone. There's, you know, it's never reached that point again. So about five, about three years ago was when I thought, okay, someone's paying attention. But it was, yeah, that, that was probably it. But I think, though, too, in fairness, though, I mean, a lot of people do like your Facebook page and comment in a sense of, True. like... And I'm super grateful to them. I mean, there are some... You've been one of them. Well, uh, there's so many people that have been super great about it, and they get it, they understand it, they know it's not a TV show, they know it's not on TV, they love to read it, and, I mean, that's important. When you're writing something, when you've created something, this this special, I think it's... I think Dark Shadows is very special. So when you've created something this special with an... A, 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 an already built-in fan base and the fans who love the show come to your stuff and say, you know what, this isn't half bad. That is amazing. That is super amazing. I'm really grateful to all the people that reach out and say that they love it. You've been amazing. You've been so supportive and I thank you for that. Oh, no. Like I, like I told you, thank you because I, I grew up... Um, when I was a kid, the first thing my mother showed me was John Carpenter's Halloween. And I watched uh, Dark Shadows in the 90s, just like you did. And it just, it's something that helped me immensely as a kid escape. And I needed it so, so bad. It's, it's the, it's the ultimate escape. Right. It is the best, I mean, look, I, a lot of people refuse to, to acknowledge that Dark Shadows is a soap opera. It is the best soap opera ever. It is the best. It is so fun. It is complete escape. I mean, soaps in the beginning were created so that housewives could sort of escape their horrible lives. And Dark Shadows took that idea and flipped it. And not only housewives could escape, but now kids could. And maybe their husbands. I mean, everybody was watching this show, seeing a family go through hell, literally. And that is perfect. I mean, who wants to see a housewife go through trouble with her bratty kid right. in a normal world? Why not have a housewife go through trouble with her bratty kid who is part of the devil worshiping world, you know what I mean? It's sort of all part of a really cool um, uh, world that we stepped into. As the writer of this, which part, which for you was your favorite sort of storied arc to write in this? Oh, so many. I really like um, uh, the Claudia, Alex, Christopher mm -hmm. love triangle. Oh, yeah. um, I love uh, uh, that's way in the beginning 
I love right. it. Actually, there's a it's a four or some, right? It's she and Leopold have some crazy. Uh, Claudia and Leopold have some crazy relationship because you know she changed him and uh, Cla- uh, uh, Carolyn's thrown in there too because she knows her husband's this new monster and she can't deal with it. And so everybody's hiding this secret because the cops are on their tail uh, looking for this dead body. So they're, the beginning, the, the very beginning, the first three series are kind of. Um, they might they might be tough to read because I was fresh at it, but probably my favorite because it was just the most um, the, the cast the cast of characters was much smaller, so it's easier to write around. And it, yeah, probably that the, Alex Leopold, Claudia, and Christopher storyline was really fun to write. I loved how when Bar- when you finally brought Barnabas into this, which wasn't until the third one, mm-hmm. the third chapter, that he sort of questioned who's Leopold. And she's like dodging it, <laughs> like oh that's that's oh my husband's cousin or whatever. Right, right, right. And he's like, I, yeah, sure it is. Yeah, like, like I'm coughing bullshit, <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> like for Barnabas, and I just I love that. Like it was just such a quick cover story for her. Like it was something you would you could see Carol like, you could see Nancy Barrett um saying like in the yeah. series. And it's funny because, like, she goes to the exact lie that they've all been saying for 50 years, a cousin. Right. And, of course, Barnabas is looking at her like, you know what, I, I know this game. <laughs> yeah, I've been there. And yeah, exactly. It, it was just, the interaction of these characters is so fascinating, the way you wrote them in. It, like I said, it's almost like you're just sitting there watching them talk. And I've always had I that like experience that. Yeah. reading this. So... Uh, Another question I have for you is, when you were putting Carolyn through like sort of hell, was it was she always going to sort of lose Jack and um, hold on, uh, sorry I lost his name. Um, I want to say Powell, Jude Powell. Sorry. Oh right, yeah, yeah. Um, she was. She. I think if she were to find happiness with somebody, <clears throat> if she were to find happiness with somebody, I think. That would sort of take, and this is horrible to say, but it would take the fun out of it. Right. She has to be miserable. She has to be miserable. She has to, uh, because she doesn't have a Paul Stoddard kind of thing, like she doesn't think she murdered somebody like her mom thought. Right. She, Elizabeth was just horribly miserable her whole life, or her whole adult life. So I wanted always to mirror that, her mom, her, her mom, her. And the only way Carolyn could be miserable, similarly to her mother, was that if she had, if she was unlucky in love. So... She's not very lucky in love at all. She has, even on her, the original show, she had really terrible boyfriends, and um, her husbands were just as bad. Even though Jack was pretty good, but, you know, it happens that he gets wrapped into the family more than he actually bargains for. I like how her her interactions with her children, like Alexandra, they don't mirror her interactions with the way her, she interacted with her mother. They're very, That's very true. They're very different. Was that always key for like i said sort of key for you to do make sure it wasn't like like i said monkey see monkey do um i think i mean i think elizabeth and carolyn were loving to each other right sometimes but you're right carolyn does treat alexander a lot better (laughs) in a way she doesn't she gives her a little more freedom i think carolyn knows what it's like to grow up trapped and at collingwood and not be able to do much so she does give alex a lot of freedom much more than she did, so I, 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 don't, I don't think I was really conscious of the, that part of it. What I wanted her to do was be, as I said, miserable like her mom in, in the way of love, but yeah, I, don't, I didn't really think about her raising her daughter the same way. I definitely, Carolyn probably would never raise her daughter the same way, for sure. Right, Every everybody raises their kid differently, and that that's something you've stressed out throughout this series as well, not just with Carolyn, with everyone like Victoria, Maggie, all of them. And so sort of take me into that, like where you gave Victoria a daughter, or not a son, not a daughter, son, God. <laughs> but it was, what went into that decision? Just Well, I wanted her to have something to fight for. So she comes back as a villain. Right. And then I thought, well, why is she a villain? Why, what is she doing? So there, I wrote the whole backstory of how she... Uh, figures out about her father and her mother. She figures out she's Elizabeth's daughter and how um, the, the, she creates this organ. She's involved in the organization. So basically what I did was I retconned how she got to Collinsport. And the 
original series, she gets this mysterious letter bringing her to town to be the governess. Well, I retcon that to it's basically a farce, it's a big fat lie that she's there for this organization to basically rid this quote unquote evil family Collins uh, from the world, right? She's kind of involved right. in this. So um, eventually, I wanted her to that that kind of ends that story that story arc ends, and I think well, Victoria is really done. She still needs something to fight for. And I realized that she never had a chance for a family of her own. She's been in this time warp of a time trap, you know, back and forth through time her whole life. And so she needed something to grasp onto. And, of course, she's never had a true love in a way that lasted longer than a couple of years or never had a family. So, I, yeah, she needed a kid. And that's where the whole aging process of Curtis came about because Curtis is kidnapped as a baby, but he comes back as a full adult. She, Victoria is now in her probably 70s. Right. Yeah, about 70s, and she can't have an infant. So I had to age him. So, and that, that, that brings me to the connection of her being a mother and her raising Curtis, and that's, that's, her, that's what she's fighting for. She's fighting to raise this boy that she has fallen in love with because she never had a chance to do it on her own. Wow. That, again, I think it was just so amazing how you just, again, you gave her something else to do. And that's, that's sort of like the consistency of this as well. Every character had something to do. The, were you When you brought Angelique finally out, was she always going to be the sort of the final villain of all of this? Uh, she's not the final villain. Oh. We'll find out in series 11. Oh. <laughs> and a couple more. See, she's definitely, <laughs> she's de- exclusive, exclusive. Angelique is not the final villain. But she's definitely wrapped up in a lot of it. Um, she's definitely the villain throughout, I think, the last two, nine and ten. But I couldn't make her good. I think making Angelique fully good, a fully good person, would um, would just not be right. I just don't think it would be right to have her be a, a, a goody goody because that's not in her nature. She's not somebody right. who is is good for being good. You know, she she's the way she is because she is a. a uh, a supernatural creature. You know, she has a bad. Uh, she's had bad luck in her life in a way. So right. I had to like. I, I had to keep her evil. I mean, she had to be evil. But there's a twist later on, and you'll see that that happens um, uh, much later on. I, I most definitely will. <laughs> just, just, just what I think. He ain't gonna sucker punch me, and he does. <laughs> he does. But <laughs> it's. Oh God. Um. Wow, I think that again, a lot of cre- you've done so much creativity on this. And before we talk about the new Dark Shadows, uh, the potential of the new series, I want to give you the floor and just talk about your series in general. What what this has meant for you the past four years? Wow, that is a, a large part of my life. I mean, not a large part of my life, but a big part of what I've been doing for the last. 10 years has been writing short stories and creating characters that for me are super important and are all a part of me. They're, they're characters that I create from my own brain as all writers do. And uh, being able to take up this little piece of pop culture that is Dark Shadows in my own way and have people who love the original, who understand the original show and like it so much um, is really, really amazing. I mean, I, I, did not know it would go this long. I had no idea that I would be writing 115 chapters of a fan fiction series, which sounds crazy. I don't even know if it's ever been done before. I don't know. And and I mean, I've done it in a way that I don't think it's been ever ever any kind of fan fiction has been done, to my knowledge. I mean, I've created social media pages for it. I create all of these different little vignettes and videos and with music. I mean, I've really gone out of my way to make it really special for people who are reading it so that they can see what I'm seeing so that they can experience it the way I'm experiencing it in my own head. Um, and I hope that people take away a real good enjoyment of reading it and, and, and experiencing it and having fun with it and not taking it too, too seriously because then, then you lose this, then you lose the spirit of the whole idea. I really loved how you did the videos, sort of like the advertisements for these. They were, they were, like you said, they were, they're, they're sort of like plugs, and they were so well yeah. done. And, I, again, that's something I want to applaud you for. And 
before we before we sorry before we like continue on uh, to talk about the new potential series I, again I just want to thank you because this speaking as a fan this has meant to read this this has meant so much to me um, and for you to come on and talk to me about this I appreciate it oh no problem I'm still a little nervous but thank you <laughs> I've had a great time <laughs> Uh, I, I always listen. I, I always love bringing people on here and talking to them, and, and especially a fellow writer, somebody who has dedicated themselves to this. And you've put a lot of dedication into this and work. Um, so that sort of brings me to the announcement we all heard here a couple, like a week, week or so ago. Um, a potential new Dark Shadow series. What are your thoughts and what do you want to see? I mean, take the last four years of my life and give it to them. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I think that, the, again, you and I have talked about it. It definitely does not want to be an identical reboot. I would hate that. Only because I think it's kind of lazy, you know? It's a little bit lazy to just start from Barnabas and do almost exactly the same thing. Um, it, that you know they did in 1966 and then in 1991 and then again in 2006 and then 2012 I think it would just be a lazy attempt at something if they really wanted to be a reboot they should do the work that people have been doing like you and I have other writers have, have the people at the audio dramas have they've taken the characters and created something fresh and different based on something else so it's, and that's hard because a lot of people will come into a new show not knowing the old stuff so right. they would definitely have to create a background in the beginning of the very first episode they would definitely have to gloss over what has gone on for 50 years that's tough that's a tough thing to do um, but I, I think that'd be the best thing to do is for them to pick up probably you know maybe I, I would do it in set 2019 for sure right pick up where the family is now, who's around, what's happened in the process. And then, um, because they have so many years in between the end of the show and 2019 to explore. There's people who have been born and died. There's people that have been in the characters, born and died, you know, family member that have come and gone. I mean, David's now in the 60s. Carolyn's in her 70s, or, or maybe David's, yeah. So pe these guys are now old enough to have their own families and their own curses and their own things to explore and they can really um expand on on the whole idea of the show better than anybody else can i mean i think i would not do it i would not repeat it but... do you think that when they when they honestly reboot this this will be a reboot this will be a new product no i think they're gonna do it exactly the, the way they've done it in 91 and in 20, 2006 i think it's gonna be probably the same thing Maybe with a few changes, they'll probably start with, you know, um, you know Barnabas again because that was the the big draw of the show. They'll probably mm -hmm. never even touch on uh, Laura Collins. They'll never talk about the Phoenix. They might, I don't know, but I doubt they will. They may never even touch on Elizabeth and Paul Stoddard and how he was, uh, you know, big that big idea that he was dead but not. Um, yeah, those kind of juicy stories that were in the beginning before Barnabas will never even touch on. I think that's a shame because that was those were really good stories. I wouldn't mind if they sort of took a Collins, took and instead of having them privately tutored. Well, now the Collins don't want to pay for private tutoring, so they're going to public school, and they have their kids going to a public school for the first time, and they're just entering high school, and you sort of get the kids' story going through high school hey i heard your house is haunted yeah, yeah they could they could totally yeah. take it there i mean that would definitely be something that they can draw in a younger audience too for sure i mean i think again i want them to have you know no matter what this is i want them to have fun with it you know what i mean like make it a good experience for the fans and make it a good story Again, I, if they if I, if I heard the announcement tomorrow, they were they were using your idea. I'd be like, I'm there, I'm watching this. But and I think again, there's there's so much material that you've created, and there's just I think that they really need to have 
their minds open and options open for what they want out of this. My, my big, that's sort of my biggest question I did today to myself before I did this interview was not, not so much about your blog. Cause I've read it and I've loved it so much was with the new series. Are they going to create something I love? Or are they going to create something that they're just sort of, I hate to use the word hot dog in it, but you know what I mean? I don't want them to hot dog it. Well, I think it all depends on um, who the production company is. Right. I mean, I don't really know a lot about the you know production companies and all that, but I think if it's somebody who is behind um, a lot of like uh, shows that are similar, like uh, you know, for example, like Riverdale or you know those kind of newest shows that deal with the supernatural and darker mm-hmm. side of things, um, I think then it might be a really great experience. But if it's somebody who's not into it and just kind of going as you say hot dogging it or half and half assing it right. just for you know who knows why for money reasons or whatever i think it could be it could be bad but it could be really good we just have to kind of wait and see i really hope they do something again special with this and just create a world full of new characters just the way you did and bring us all new stories again that's something i personally want to see <laughs> I mean, I've seen the six. I know you've seen all of it. You've seen the sixties. You've seen the revival, the O the four unaired pilot, the three movies which aren't canon to the series, by the way. But <laughs> so what? I got to get your thoughts on that too. What are your thoughts on the three movies not being canon with the series? Uh, well, I've never seen the first two. Oh wow. I've never seen the first two. I the re, for the reason for that is because I knew that they weren't canon to the series, and I didn't want to. Uh, first of all, when I watched it as a kid um, in junior high, I didn't actually know there was movies. I found out about the movies much, much, much later, and I was already writing the series when I found out there were two movies about it. And I didn't want to watch the movies because I didn't want to accidentally absorb right. newer storylines into my own because I knew for sure I wouldn't do the old stuff, but the newer stuff I didn't want to take from that and then put it into mine and then when the 2012 one came out well i knew for sure i wouldn't copy any of that (laughs) and to be fair to john he has said that to me before that he did he doesn't want to copy anybody else's stuff and that's something i that's something i appreciate as a writer to hear from another writer that you you really want your own true ideas you don't want to take from someone else and that's something yeah and it can happen by accident you know, it can happen right. totally by accident where you – and it, it shows that whatever you saw, whatever movie you saw, whatever whatever story you read was that good because you absorb it and it becomes part of your little – your own little world in your head and then you accidentally write about it. That that can happen. I mean I've done it to myself in my own stories, for my own short stories where I'm like, oh, shoot, I, I've already wrote a story about this. So I've had to rearrange other stuff, not Dark Shadow stuff, but other stories. So right. it can happen. So I definitely wanted to steer clear – of, um, for example, like when your when your stories come out, if I'm writing my own, I'm definitely make sure that I write all of my chapters before I read yours, so that I don't accidentally cross reference it, because that would be horrible. It would be unfair to you. It'd be unfair to me. It would just be. It wouldn't be fun. When I when I write mine, I just tell myself, listen, don't copy John. <laughs> no, hey, yours are way unique. I love the way you put together a story. Yours are very unique. Super. I feel like there's there's something really ex- like it's almost like an action drama that I've never been able to do really, and that I don't definitely the show never did. Yours are really fun to read. The like, last ones with the in the island of Martinique, fabulous. Thank. You. Well, what inspired Angelique's past was actually my conversation with you. <laughs> well, well, remember the, we talked about that. We talked about how they didn't really explain that very much. And it's 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 funny what when I how I get an idea. If somebody says, well, you know, they never did this, and it just, okay, I can do that. <laughs> right. That's totally, it's it's no-brainer, right? They never really explored um, Sam Evans' life with his wife. We don't know anything about them. You never knew about the, the real, what really happened in Martinique, which now you've kind of filled in. You know what I'm saying? It's, those are really big puzzle pieces that the show never got a chance to do. And I think yours was so fun. It was, like, perfect. Like, it took you to an island. It, there's all this kind of magic, and I love the, the the people behind the waterfall. You know, her people, Angelique's people. That's such an awesome creation. I love it. Har- I got to give Harley credit 
to my, my wife because I said I don't have a name for Angelique's main witch and she, and it's funny she goes well there goes a Harley Davidson down the road I'm like oh Harley Harley yeah <laughs> Harley thank you <laughs> but yeah that's how that came about and it just you know stuff happens you know that it just shit comes to you but totally I again I just I can't thank you enough for joining me and this series has been amazing I can't wait to read I for, and I do want to ask you a couple more questions I don't just want to send sure. you away I mean because I'm enjoying this conversation and this interview to be honest but <laughs> I for you is this just the toughest thing for you to do to end this and why end this now I guess this without spoiling um <laughs> right so it's it's gonna end it's definitely gonna end i leave it with a very big cliffhanger okay Ugh, i hope i didn't spoil it too much but yes there is a there's a giant cliffhanger at the end because i definitely will miss writing it right um, what i do is i write dark shadows in between writing these short stories that i have right. on a different on a different website right. and when i get bored at the end, I'm like, God, I really want to write it again, and I don't really have a short story idea, so Dark Shadows is my, my fun job. It's, it's coming back to this crazy town and writing more about these people that have a really crazy life, and it's, it's sort of like a default for me because after I write about whatever, I can default back to Dark Shadows and have a wonderful time writing. So, But I just feel like it's a good time to end this version of it, and maybe, in a, I don't know, who knows? In the future, maybe I'll I'll pick up where this where this cliffhanger ends and start fresh again, because um, it definitely will not pick up with the same characters if I do that. Everything will be different. Right. Well, if you do, you'll I'll, see that at the you'll if, see that at the end. If you do, I will be there with bells on, man. That's for sure. <laughs> well, let's see. Let's see in the springtime when I'm bored again, and if I can start up. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. I won't. I won't promise anything. Right. right. We we're not we're not gonna hold a gun to John's head here, no. <laughs> But, um, no, nah, I just, I think you've done an amazing job. And, again, this, to me, and I, I know I've said this on Facebook, and I mean this, this, to me, has been the best thing since the original series that I watched. And because yeah, here's something I've always wanted is originality. That's what Dan Curtis gave all of us. And I think that's what your blog has exactly done. It's given us back that originality that we once had. So, and that's sort of where I'll leave this. And I, I just want to thank you so, so much for joining me. No, thank you for having me. I really had a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. I do want to bring you back on again to discuss other stuff. And I know we're on Messenger and on Facebook. So, I, again, thank you so much. I'm going to tag a bunch of Dark Shadows people in this, obviously. And <laughs> I just want to thank John for giving his time to me. And God bless, man. Take care. And I'll, we'll talk thank you, later. Thank you. All right, talk to you later. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye.